Hello everyone, I'm El Iso Elohim and I'd love for you to join me as we continue the search for racial equality and stand against the racial injustice of Islam with Act 17 apologetics. Lately, even Google has been taking a stand against racial inequality, displaying, we stand in support of racial equality and all those who search for it, on its front page. While I agree with the stance, I was surprised Google was willing to speak out against Islam like that, even for the single day they did, so I tested the facade. Unfortunately, even with the clear Google video search, Racial Equality in Islam, David Wood, X-17 Apologetics, the top results were still completely unrelated. It wasn't even until the third page of results that any videos posted by David Wood of X-17 Apologetics showed up, and even then, it was unrelated to the topic I searched. Switching over to YouTube, after watching YouTube's video ad entitled, Stand Against Racial Injustice, I continued my mission to do so by searching the same terms as before. Since YouTube did bring up the relevant videos, and David Wood gave me permission to play them in my own, I'll let him illuminate this issue I alluded to regarding racism within Islam. Muhammad's companions were so obsessed with their prophet being white that they wouldn't merely say, as they often did, that he was white. They would take things a step further by going body part by body part, describing the whiteness of his shins, and the whiteness of his thigh, and the whiteness of his leg, and the whiteness of his stomach, and the whiteness of his forearms, and the whiteness of his armpits, and the whiteness of his cheeks. If Muhammad's companions were this obsessed with Muhammad's epic whiteness, it was clearly an insult to falsely claim that he was black. And this is exactly what Muslim scholars concluded. Hence, we read in Qadi Ayad's Ash-Shifa, one of Islam's most popular and respected books on Muhammad's life and teachings, page 287, Ahmed ibn Suleiman, Sahnun's companion, said that whoever says that the Prophet was black is killed. The Prophet was not black we find the same penalty mentioned in another section of Ash-Shifa. We read on page 275, Ahmad ibn Abi Suleiman, the companion of Sahnun, said, anyone who says that the Prophet was black should be killed. This penalty is recorded in a section titled, The Judgment of the Sharia Regarding Someone Who Curses or Disparages the Prophet. So, if you call Muhammad a black man, you're either cursing him, or you're disparaging him, or both. Which is it, Muslims? Based on these descriptions, a friend of mine who's a police sketch artist was able to put together a drawing of Muhammad. Have you seen this man? It kind of blends in with the whiteness of the paper. On a side note, to all my jihadi viewers, I can't figure out if this counts as a cartoon of Muhammad or not. But I don't really care. So, Muhammad was whiter than a bowl of Cool Whip. But when he wasn't busy being scooped onto a slice of apple pie, he was setting an example for his followers by keeping a tight rein on all his black slaves. Sahih al-Bukhari, 72, 63. Narrated Umar, I went to the house of the Prophet, and behold, Allah's Messenger was staying in a mashrubah, and a black slave of Allah's Messenger was at the top of its stairs. I said to him, Tell the Prophet that here is Umar bin al-Khattab. Then he admitted me. Sahih al-Bukhari, 61-61. Narrated Anas bin Malik, Allah's messenger was on a journey, and he had a black slave called Anjasha, and he was driving the camels very fast, and there were women riding on those camels. Allah's messenger said, Waihaka, O Anjasha, drive slowly the camels with the glass vessels, i.e. the women. Here's one about a black slave who was shot to death while unloading Muhammad's luggage. Sunan Andasai, 3858. It was narrated that Abu Huraira said, We were with the Messenger of Allah in the year of Kaibar, and we did not get any spoils of war except for wealth, goods, and clothes. Then a man from Banu Ad-Dubayb, who was called Rifa bin Zaid, gave the Messenger of Allah a black slave who was called Middam. The Messenger of Allah set out for Wadi al-Qura. When we were in Wadi al-Qura, while Middam was unloading the luggage of the Messenger of Allah, an arrow came and killed him. The people said, Congratulations, you will go to paradise. But the Messenger of Allah said, no, by the one in whose hand is my soul, the cloak that he took from the spoils of war on the day of Kaibar is burning him with fire. Just to clarify, Muhammad had sex with a nine-year-old girl, robbed caravans, and beheaded hundreds of Jews, but he's good. His black slave, by contrast, 
grabbed a cloak before the spoils were divided, so he's headed to hell. Welcome to a slum. In Provisions of the Afterlife, pages 30 to 31, Ibn Qayyim al Jazia lists 28 of Muhammad's male slaves and 12 of his female slaves. Some of these slaves were black, some were not. Muhammad renamed one of his black slaves Safina, which means ship. He called his slave ship because he would load up the slave like a ship and make him carry everything. Muhammad apparently thought that black slaves were worth less than Arab slaves, since he once traded two of his black slaves for an Arab slave he wanted to set free because the Arab slave had converted to Islam. The heading says that this hadith is about selling animals for different animals of different amounts or quality. Nasai is considered one of the greatest hadith collectors of all time. He knew the history of Muhammad and his companions inside and out, and his scholarly conclusion was that slaves are on the same level as animals. We know that Muhammad had sex with his female slaves because he eventually got one of them pregnant. But don't worry, a white leader getting a slave girl pregnant is only creepy when Thomas Jefferson does it. Speaking of leaders, mindlessly obeying Muslim leaders was so important to Muhammad that when he wanted to emphasize obedience, he told his followers that they had to obey even the worst leader imaginable. We find Muhammad's worst case scenario in Sahih al-Bukhari 7142. Narrated Anas bin Malik, Allah's Messenger said, You should listen to and obey your Imam, even if he was an Ethiopian slave whose head looks like a raisin. Muhammad gives a similar example in Sahih Muslim 3138, where he commands his followers to obey their leader, even if he's a black slave with missing limbs. So the worst possible leader of a community of Muslims, according to Muhammad, would be a black slave. Muhammad tells his followers what Satan looks like in Ibn Ishaq, page 243. The Apostle said, Whoever wants to see Satan, let him take a look at Nabtal ibn al-Harith. He was a sturdy black man with long flowing hair, inflamed eyes, and dark ruddy cheeks. According to Muhammad, the prophet of racial equality, who claimed that black people look like Satan. Which one of you is the prophet? This white guy. What does Satan look like? That black guy. Hence, the ultimate enemy of Muslims everywhere is, according to Muhammad, black. But Satan isn't the only enemy of Muslims. There's also the leader of the army that will destroy the Kaaba, the heart of Muslim worship. Chapter 49 of Book 25 of Sahih al-Bukhari is titled, The Demolishing of the Kaaba. Below that, we have Aisha saying that the Prophet said, an army will attack the Kaaba, and that army will sink down in the earth. Who are these people, and what race is their leader? Sahih al-Bukhari, 1595. Narrated Ibn Abbas, the Prophet said, as if I am looking at him, a black person with thin legs plucking out the stones of the Kaaba, one after another. Sahih al-Bukhari, 1596. Narrated Abu Huraira, Allah's Messenger said, Dus Sawaikatain, the thin-legged man from Ethiopia, will demolish the Kaaba. As we've seen in previous videos, Muhammad, the whitest prophet in history, bought, owned, sold, and traded black African slaves. He referred to Ethiopians as raisin heads, he told his followers that Satan looks like a black man and that a thin-legged black man would eventually destroy the Kaaba, Islam's holiest site. But Muhammad was also an expert in the exciting field of dream interpretation. Jamia at Termidi, 2290. Salim bin Abdullah narrated from his father about the dream of the prophet who said, I saw a black woman with unkempt hair going out of al Madinah." until she stood in Mahya, and it is Al-Jufa. So I interpreted that to be an epidemic in al Madina that would spread to Al-Jufa. Now, how did a religion that was inaugurated by a white prophet who had black slaves and referred to Ethiopians as raisin heads and said that Satan looks like a black man ever get the reputation it has among African-American Muslims today? Well, here in the West, there's a general atmosphere of ignorance about Islam. People don't know even the most basic facts about Muhammad and the Quran, and this allows Muslim preachers to say whatever they want about Islam because no one's going to correct them. So if a Muslim preacher is talking to a woman who's interested in women's rights, 
Muhammad was a champion of women's rights. If he's talking to someone who has a high regard for science, the Quran is a scientific masterpiece filled with miraculous scientific insights that were only verified centuries later. If he's talking to someone who's concerned about racial justice, Islam is the religion that liberates slaves and establishes racial equality. Absolute nonsense, but people convert to Islam because they believe what they're told and don't bother reading the Muslim sources to see if the preacher's story checks out. Now, to those of you who've bought this mess, to those of you who believed the Muslim preacher when he said, hey, if you really want to stick it to whitey, you need to convert to Islam, the religion of a white man who bought, sold, and traded African slaves and whose followers institutionalized black African slavery centuries before Europeans joined in and who continue enslaving black Africans even today. If you fell for this, I say and I say it again, you've been had, you've been took, you've been hoodwinked, bamboozled, led astray, run amok. This is what these white prophets with black slaves do. But now that you've seen what the Muslim sources say, now that you know you've been deceived, you have a choice. You can either leave Islam or you can continue serving a man whose descriptions in your most trusted sources make him completely indistinguishable from the Pillsbury Doughboy and whose teachings legitimized race-based slavery for 14 centuries. Just remember that if you continue honoring a slave trader who is about as dark as the cream filling of a Twinkie and who had black slaves and called Ethiopians raisin heads and said that Satan looks like a black man, you're not a freedom fighter or a social justice warrior or a champion of civil rights. You are the ultimate Uncle Tom. Now that we know the truth about the racial injustice of Islam and the racial inequality taught by the Quran, how can we stand up for what is right? We, for one, can take the bold stance against Islam and use our voices to speak up against it alongside David Wood and many other amazing Christian apologists. In addition to standing up against these evil doctrines yourself, you can also help those of us who already have been by supporting our channels by subscribing, liking our videos, and sharing the content you love so that other people can come to see the truth too. It's not an easy journey to spread the truth with those who love lies, but it is so important, and I know we can continue to do so more each day. Let's pray. God, thank you for loving us, regardless of all the different shades of beautiful pigmentation you have given to us. Please help those who hate others to come to see your love and to stop spreading such evil doctrines. May you be glorified in everything we do, and may we continue to spread the truth despite the prevalence of lies. In your holy, precious name, Yahweh, and in the Father, Son, and Spirit. Amen.